How many Chinas are there in the world? We give you 30 seconds to think about it, but it is better not to even try. No one can figure this out for 50 years. You better not raise this topic in China under any circumstances, they consider it only a matter of the Chinese. But even in the US, the situation is not getting any clearer. There is not only the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979, but also the Taiwan Relations Enhancement Act of 2020. It seems like the US thinks that there are two Chinas. But still, not just visits but even phone calls from American officials to Taiwan are extremely rare. American corporations like Blizzard ruthlessly fire and ban employees for any mention of Hong Kong and Taiwan in a negative way. Why is that and how did the history of the Beijing-Taipei rivalry begin? Get comfortable, friends, all the answers in the next couple of minutes. Usually videos on this topic refer to 1949, but we'll dig a little deeper and start with 8000 BC. It's the end of the Stone Age, better known as the Neolithic. The so-called Austronesians live in a place which is now called the Chinese province of Fujian. Austronesians got their name from their language and they were quite smart for their time. They are believed to be among the first on the planet to invent the technology of sails. And they also have primitive analog of paper. The Austronesians were mainly engaged in agriculture, in which they were quite successful. But closer to the 5th millennium BC, they got under the pressure of the more numerous Sino-Tibetan peoples, which are known as Tibeto Chinese. It led to a migration that will go down in history as the expansion of the Austronesians. First of all, as part of the expansion, ancient people moved from eastern China to Taiwan. It was unknown to them, their first Austronesian settlements on the island are dated as far back as 8000 BC. But then, thanks to their technological development, the Austronesians settled the entire ocean. Their descendants can be found in Indonesia, the Philippines, Polynesia, and even in Madagascar. But today we are going to talk about Taiwan, where Austronesians became ancestors of Aborigines of the island. According to the data for 2020, more than half a million Taiwanese are considered to be direct descendants of prehistoric Austronesians. Up to the beginning of our era, China did not care much about the island, but the Taiwan Strait and the geography of the island could not remain unnoticed. As early as in the 3rd century AD, Taiwan is mentioned in the Chinese chronicles as an island of barbarians. In the year of 239, mainland China sent the 10,000th Expeditionary Corps to the island. In 605, they repeated the operation and brought the natives to the mainland, who were taught Chinese language and as a result were used in negotiations. There is not much reliable information from those times, but it is known that already in the 7th century on the Pengu Islands and in Taiwan itself, there were villages created by the mainland Chinese and Japanese. Pirates of that country, as well as Chinese, like to use unknown Taiwan as a place for their bases. However, it was a dangerous thing to do because the Aborigines of Taiwan were violent. They widely practiced a tradition which required the fiancé to bring a Chinese head to the elders to prove his maturity in order to marry. The Mongols, who came to power in China in the 13th century, weren't against violence as well. During the Yuan Dynasty, the Pengu Islands and part of Taiwan came under mainland control. Waves of migration from impoverished areas to the islands started. And since then, an unstoppable process of pushing Taiwanese people closer to the mountains has also begun. Even though the most habitable lands were occupied by the mainland Chinese, the descendants of migrants from Fujian and Guangdong provinces are the majority of Taiwan's current population. But before that, they, like most of the planet, had to suffer because of the European colonizers. In 1517, the Portuguese of sailed past the island and named it Formosa, which translates as beautiful. But the Dutch from the East India Company did not keep themselves waiting and China fell out of the equation of the island for which the Spaniards and the Dutch fought. The Dutch won, but their full control of the island lasted only for 20 years. Nevertheless, during this time, they managed to remain in the history of Taiwan. The Dutch were the ones who helped the Chinese migrants to displace the local Aborigines and they were the ones who taught the Taiwanese to use animals for work in the fields as well as different types of fertilizers. And as the cherry on the cake, the Dutch left behind educated locals who could write. But do not be fooled, like in the case of other colonies, Europeans were mainly interested in profit. Therefore, rebellions were quite common. As a result of one of them, in 1662, Taiwan was taken over by the Ming Dynasty. This, by the way, is the earliest case in history when a colony was completely taken from Europeans. Also was the first documented case when Taiwan was proclaimed as an independent state. As the Ming Dynasty on the mainland was replaced by the Qing Dynasty, the generals and residents who fled from it founded the Republic of Formosa on the island, which was called the Kingdom of Formosa in Europe. It did not last long in the year of 1683, the Manchurians of the Qing Dynasty, with the help of the Dutch and some sanctions, regained control of Taiwan. From then until the year of 1895, the island was under the full control of mainland China. 
but there were some nuances as well. First, the Qing Empire did not take Taiwan seriously, considering it as a puppet of China. Second, most of the island's population kept the traditions of the Ming Dynasty and stood up against the Qing guys, who were considered as invaders. Thirdly, in the 19th century, the Opium Wars broke out. Great Britain did not like the independence of China and the fact that it didn't want to trade with their opium. Great Britain formed a coalition and quickly defeated the Qing Dynasty troops, what led to hunger, devastation, and drug addiction in the country. The Western powers saw Taiwan as an excellent springboard for military and political operations against China. Taiwan's trade with Europe and Japan increased dramatically, but when China realized this, it was too late. Nevertheless, it was a good effort. In 1885, Taiwan had received full-fledged province status. The Chinese government built the first railroad there, renovated ports and infrastructure as well. Even today's Taiwan authorities warmly remember this period. We will never know how this story would have ended because in the late 80s Japan went to war with China. Japan won and with the support of the West they took Taiwan, even though China did not accept the terms of the treaty. It was the first experience in colonial affairs for the Japanese and in just a couple of decades, Taiwan became the most advanced territory in Southeast Asia, except Japan itself. In 1895 there were 50 kilometer of railroads on the island, and 10 years later under the Japanese leadership there were 500 of them. Taiwan was electrified, new agricultural technology was introduced and by the time of World War I it was a world-class economy. However, it is worth mentioning that the Japanese governed the island as harshly as possible. Nevertheless, before World War II, Japanese militarism took its toll. Taiwan started to be assimilated and even recruited into the Japanese army. You probably know how it ended. We can only add that many Taiwanese participated on the Japanese side in the Nanking Massacre and other war crimes. But most people still preferred to return to China as a result of World War II, and still it wasn't without incidents as well. At the Potsdam Conference, it seemed that Japan was forced to give up Taiwan, but no reasonable peace treaties were signed until 1951. During the signing of the documents in San Francisco, China was not even invited. As a result, the question of the island's statehood was not completely resolved. The chaos wasn't only in the documents and treaties. Since the year of 1927, China's civil war had been at its peak. The Chinese Republic and the Chinese Communists were dividing territories and were the site of a confrontation between the great powers even before World War II. The Republic, for example, was supported by Germany in the 30s and the Communists, obviously, by the Soviet Union. Because of the war with Japan and the subsequent World War, the Chinese had no time for internal struggles. But as soon as the situation in the world got better, the old disagreements returned. The Communists and Republicans immediately began to take over the cities the second after the surrender of Japan and tried to take as much territory as they could in order to claim legitimacy for their government. Mao Zedong won the civil war with the Communists. Chiang Kai-shek evacuated to Taiwan where a dictatorship had been established since 1949. The first thing Chiang Kai-shek proclaimed was the establishment of the Republic of China on the island. And then he imposed martial law. It lasted as much as 38 years and is considered to be the longest in the history. Martial law has been known as the White Terror, in which many thousands of Taiwanese were arrested, tortured, and executed on suspicion of cooperation with the Communist Party of mainland China. Total censorship was imposed on the island, strikes were banned, and Taiwan's defensive lines were actively built up. The second half of the 20th century brought several active phases of the confrontation. Miraculously, full-scale wars between the PRC and Taiwan did not start. A crucial role in the events was always played by the USA. Immediately after World War II, American specialists were involved in economic reconstruction and investment. Wolf Ladzinski carried out an excellent agrarian reform that led to defeudalization and the establishment of market relations. The labor-intensive industries that the U.S. carefully covered with its military power also grew. In 1979, the Taiwan Relations Act was passed. It implied direct military support for the island in the event of a military confrontation with the PRC. And initially, a representative of China at the UN was from Taiwan. However, along with formal support for the island, the great powers could not ignore the growing potential of the PRC. In 1971, mainland China took a seat in the UN as the only representative of the state. Since then, Taiwan has tried several times to argue against this and even submitted its own application, but every time, under the pressure of mainland China, the application was rejected. The U.S. has also changed its rhetoric. Instead of unambiguous support for Taiwan, the so-called policy of strategic ambivalence has come into play. On the one hand, the United States and its satellite states support Taiwan. Taiwan has informal embassies and authorities in almost all Western countries. 
But on the other hand, no one formally acknowledges them as the U.S. officially recognizes the People's Republic of China as the only legitimate representative of the people of China. This leads to a situation like the one in 2020 when another act on strengthening relations with Taiwan was passed. Nevertheless, the U.S. conducts all official negotiations with the PRC, prohibiting its corporations to even mention the independence of the island. Occasionally, the situation swings back and forth depending on the current relations between the United States and China. But the status quo established in the 80s is still in place today. China sticks to the concept of a unified country, while Taiwan strives for official independence. Some people in the world support the position of one and others the opposite. There are even people who are trying to get their own advantage from both China and Taiwan. It is obvious, because Taiwan's economy has grown at one of the fastest rates in the world. And now it is a paradise of semiconductors, electronic industry, and even nuclear power. Of course, the island's main trading partner is China. Despite the fact that it does not pay any taxes or royalties to China, the volume of mutual trade is growing every year. At the same time, the democratization of society on the island is increasing. In 1987, the state of war was finally abolished. In 1996, direct presidential elections were held. And by the beginning of the 2000s, the position of the Kuomintang had weakened, who had been running the island for half a century. At the moment, tensions in the region are rising again. But explaining the current situation is all about politics. Our task is history, and in this video, we tried our best to explain the history of the two Chinas, which are kind of united and kind of not. Thank you guys for watching. Subscribe and like the video if you enjoyed it.